Thank you all for being here. Um, I uh, have been very fortunate. My name is TJ Stiles. I'm a biographer and historian. And it's uh, to my great honor, I've been um, friends and an admirer of uh, Heather Cox Richardson for many years. But uh, recently, your profile has risen. And my wife, who you haven't met, but who I've mentioned before that I saw you or talked to you or emailed you, and, uh, and just in the last year, she said, you know Heather Cox Richardson? <laughs> 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 so um, let me start with a few reminders. Uh, the club would like to thank Roy and Betsy Eisenhart for supporting tonight's Future of Democracy program. If you have any questions for Heather, then please fill them out on question cards uh, that were sitting on your seats. And if you're joining us online, do so through the YouTube chat. And tonight's program is being recorded, so we kindly ask that you silence your cell phones for the duration of the program. Now, it is, again, my pleasure and honor to introduce tonight's guest, Heather Cox Richardson. She's a professor of history at Boston College and a renowned authority on American political and economic history. She's the author of several groundbreaking books on everything from the Wounded Knee Massacre to the history of the Republican Party. In a time when many of us are looking for moral clarity, Heather's popular newsletter, Letters from an American, synthesizes history and modern political analysis. She goes beyond the daily news cycle to offer enlightening connections between past and present. Her work reminds us that democracy is a process, not an endpoint. Heather is also the co-host of the Vox Media podcast, Now and Then, and currently the best-selling author of Democracy Awakening, Notes on the State of America. Welcome to San Francisco and to the company. It, it is a real pleasure to be here, and thanks so much both to the Commonwealth Club and to TJ for being here. TJ is one of my favorite historians, certainly favorite biographers, and I just always have to put in a plug. You all know him for his two Pulitzer Prize winnings, winning biographies, I'm sure, but my favorite of his books is his biography of Jesse James, which did not win a Pulitzer, um, but is at least as good as the other two, so you should all run out and read the Jesse James book, which is a great view of Reconstruction. So I'm thrilled to be here and to be hashing over history. Thank you very much. I uh, um, had threatened in the green room that I was just going to ask, so Donald Trump, what's up with that? <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but we're here to talk about your, your book, um, not just your, your insights or your um, newsletter. And uh, so I, I just wanted to, you know, it's not the same thing as your newsletter. And, um, and it's very interesting in, in many ways as well. It's a real pleasure to read and, and very insightful. So I just wanted to start off by um, asking you, you know, what was the, the need that you saw in terms of the book specifically? And, you know, who's the audience? What were, you, what were you thinking about when you formed your whole idea of the book? So this is fun because I, somebody actually said to me that they were really shocked that it wasn't just a series of essays from the book, which had honestly never from occurred to me. I'm sorry, from yes. the newsletter, which had honestly never occurred to me. Um, the book was set out to answer the questions that people ask me every day. How do the parties switch sides? What is a Southern strategy? Do we live in a democracy or a republic? Um, uh, what is what does uh, liberalism mean? Questions like that. But what I realized pretty early on was that what everybody asked me is, how did we get here? What on earth is going on? And how do we get out of it? <laughs> so the book was designed to be 30 short essays that could be read while you were falling asleep before bed um, that covered individual questions, but that told the story of how we got here, where we are, and how we get out. But what happened was really interesting because, and, and this I, I suspect you sympathize with, normally you know what a book is, you're gonna do in a book. You, you set out to write a certain book. And I wrote this, this manuscript, and because of how busy I was with the letters, I didn't reread any of the chapters as I wrote them. I would write it, I'd throw it in a file, and I'd, I wouldn't look at it again. And I figured I'd just hash it all out at the end. 
And what happened was I took about three months off between writing that first draft and picking it up again. And what I found when I went back to it was that um, it was telling a very different story than I thought I had written. So it was rather as if when you teach in a, in a college classroom, if you, you, know, you bring a lot of material to the students, but sometimes if you leave the students alone with it, they end up in a very different place than you thought they were going to. And the manuscript felt very much like that to me. It had told a story that I had not seen that felt to me like it came from my readers. And it was the story of how democracies die through the use of language and history and how that can be reclaimed. So I actually went back and rewrote about 80% of the manuscript mm. and it became a very different book than I had thought it was going to be. So that's where it came from. And it ended up, the reason it's dedicated to my readers is because it's a very different book than I set out to read, to write. Yeah, and, and that's interesting because it's, it's very much, it's obviously uh, reflects the, um, your expertise and your, your academic depth and yet it is not an academic book. Um, it's, it's written for um, you know, sort of a, a, a living, active, in the moment audience of which you are one. You know, I mean, you're, you know, you're writing while, while we're in the, um, the swirling waters. You're saying, we got here because, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you're in it with all of us. Well, the audience is definitely not just the people who read my nightly newsletter, but anyone who wants to understand how do we get here and where here is. I have to say that second section is really scary, I think, mm -hmm. even still. And then how we get out. But I would argue, and since you're uh, an academic of sorts as well, I think there is a theory in the book that I did not intend to have there originally that is a look at how the use of language and history determines the shape of a nation. Mm, that's very interesting, because the, the the structure of the book is is fascinating because you you have this kind of review of history and um, how the the modern Republican Party came to be in the rise of authoritarianism, then getting into an in depth account of um, the Trump administration, kind of the depths that we got to, but then you go back again. To history, and and you recount the the history of of self um, assertion of of agency of how people have made America better, and it's sort of like there's you show one track, which is a part of American history, but then you get into the the other track as well, and so it's a sort of three part structure which actually leaves you with hope after taking it all away in the second part. So. so <laughs> <laughs> so, so, did I just, you, so did you start off thinking that's how you were going to do it? Or? The, the order has always been the same. Uh. But I just have to say here, this is one of the great joys of being on a stage with a man who has won two Pulitzers because he's a writer. And you can see he picked that up. He picked up that there's a number of things going on in the structure, including in the first two sections, the actors, for the most part, not 100%, but most of them, are powerful white men. Yeah except the, the other voices start to come in in that second section. So the beginning is all powerful white men. Then the, you start to hear other voices in that middle section. And then, of course, the third section is an entirely different kettle of fish. So that, that is um, absolutely what, what was going on with that. Yeah, I think Mike Johnson will be happy with that. You really showed 18th century <laughs> values. <laughs> um, but... You know, in terms of this, it's, it's interesting to me when we think about um, Donald Trump and how he, um, he, he's both a product of uh, Republican Party history in the last century, and he's also, um, you know, a disruptor. But, you know, how much, you know, would we have gotten, would just anybody have, have this is a terrible question. Historians hate this. You know, well, would this have happened if it hadn't been Trump? But um, Trump is clearly a, an unusual, um, he's an anomaly. I mean, as a person, um, an unfortunate anomaly. And, and the question is, you know, you know he's, not, he's not a traditional Republican in any way, even though he feeds off of and picks up uh, a lot of what had happened in the Republican Party. Maybe, you know, we don't have tons of time, but maybe you could talk a little bit about how you connect that, that history to, you know, this anomalous um, 
person who came along. Well, so I always think of Trump not as a politician, but as a salesman, mm. because he reflected a certain moment in American history in which uh, a certain group of Americans had been primed to look at the world in a certain way, and he mirrored them, them back to themselves. So he, I think, answers a question that theorists like Eric Hoffer, who was a longshoreman here in San Francisco in the 1950s after World War II, um, wrote about when he wrote True Believers in 1951, when he said, you know, Stop worrying about Hitler and Mussolini, because everyone's wondering where Hitler and Mussolini came from. And the truth is, every generation has Hitlers and Mussolinis. The question is, what people are willing to follow them? So you need to look at the people and figure out what's going on with the people. And I think Trump was the logical extension of 40 years of Republican rhetoric that had created this idea that followed very closely the patterns that people like Hoffer and Hannah Arendt had, had noticed of how you create a population that is willing to follow a strong man. You create a disaffected population, either religiously or economically or socially, um, that feels that they have been that they have been left behind. They're not as important as they feel that they have been in the past, and that they should be again. And you tell them, you come in, you you tell them that they can regain that power if only you, you're, as a strong man, is able to to direct the direct society. So you say to them, I'm the one who can fix things. I can make things great again. And the way that I'm going to do that is to stop the influence of them, those people. And as long as, long as you're attacking those people, I'm going to make you great again. And Trump mirrored that, but he mirrored it in a really interesting way because people tend to forget in 2016, he was the most economically moderate Republican on the debate stage. Remember, he called for infrastructure, he called for fairer taxes, he called for cheaper and better health care, he called for bringing manufacturing back. Now, those are all things, of course, that, that um, the Biden administration achieved, but those are things that Trump called for at the same time that the other Republicans on the stage were, were doing just the opposite. Now, he also, of course, had the racism and the sexism that became the hallmarks of his administration. But in that moment, he was reflecting a certain kind of people who felt disaffected because of the language that they had been hearing for 40 years. Now, then once he's in office, he did something very different, though. And that was taking that group of disaffected people and turning them into a movement. And that, in that, again, he followed the same hallmarks that um, that other authoritarians do, using the influence of street violence, for example, to convince people that they were part of a group that was fighting against that other, but then to make them vulnerable both to the idea that they were welded to each other through that violence and also made them much more susceptible to then accepting the ideology that was being handed down to them. That's, again, a theory about where how you turn really disaffected people into a movement rather than simply being apathetic. He did those things. I think the question is, if it weren't Trump, would it have been someone else? And I've never answered that question before. Honestly, I've never thought about that question before. But I actually think probably yes, that that was the, I think that was a surprise for a number of establishment Republicans in 2017. They didn't see it coming. But every theorist of uh, right-wing authoritarianism will tell you that once the conditions are there, all it takes is the bad guy. And maybe in some ways we lucked out. Because there's always a bad guy out, out there, right? Because there's always a bad guy. Maybe in some ways we lucked out because he's not very smart. <laughs> yeah, I know, that's true. <laughs> well, he did beat Obama in his first election, so. I understand, um, I understand he won all 50 said. states. <laughs> um, yeah, it's really interesting to me because you know, the, the movement conservatism is, is such a, a powerful um, aspect of recent Republican Party history. And, you know, I was raised in a rural Republican household, and my parents were of the um, fiscal conservative, um, you know, socially, not, they didn't want to spend any money on social liberalism, but they really believed in human equality. And they said, and, you know, you're responsible with your money. And, and, and that kind of 
conservatism got swept away by movement conservatism, which was all about um, trying to strangle the, the federal government, um, you know, cut back on federal expenditures, um, give free reign to corporations, um, et cetera, et cetera. And none of that is important to uh, Trump and his, his rise. I mean, th that's what I was saying about how you just elucidated how it is that Trump was able to come in and completely basically reject all of the main policy points of the elders of his party um, by capturing and enhancing and, and um, uh, boiling over the discontent. Were you from the middle of a country, as I recall? Yeah, I'm, I grew up about 90 miles north of Minneapolis. Okay, so, so the, that old, that, that centerpiece of republicanism from the 19th century, yeah. um, where it was the, 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 um, the Wisconsin project and all that, where the idea behind republicanism really was sort of fiscal conservatism and social liberalism. Mm -hmm. um, no, uh, the, the, so the Republican Party, of course, splits pretty dramatically in the... Um, in the 1960s over the idea of whether or not they should go with traditional republicanism, the middle of the country republicanism, or this new faction of people coming out of both the West's dislike of government regulation and the South's dislike of um, legislation that promotes um, uh, uh, civil rights, especially within the states. And those groups come together. They come together, you know, it, they begin to articulate a set of principles in 1937 with something that's called the, the um, Conservative Manifesto. And that Conservative Manifesto in 37 is an attempt to push back against this uh, FDR government that, and, that is uh, regulating business and providing a basic social safety net and promoting infrastructure and to some degree working on civil rights. And in order to push back against that, the people who put together the, the uh, conservative manifesto call instead for government to do these things, to back away from the idea of regulating business because that hurts a man's ability to accumulate and to rise and to run his business however he wants, to get out of the social welfare business, which they say belongs to the churches, to get out of, um, the idea of promoting any kind of infrastructure because that too should be done by private enterprise where the, the money should then go into public po pockets, into private pockets and you wouldn't have to have taxes. And finally, of course, they want absolutely nothing to do with civil rights. They want what they call home rule so that states get to decide on racial matters. Does that sound familiar? Yes. <laughs> that idea, um, and they call themselves conservatives because they're saying we want to get rid of the New Deal government, that idea becomes a political movement, and that's how they become known as movement conservatives. And that's what takes over the Republican Party, splits away the traditional Republicans, but they've been long gone. They really disappeared in the 2000 aughts at the very latest. Maybe a few of them were still around, mm -hmm. but with the 1990s and Newt Gingrich calling all of them Republicans in name only, they were essentially erased. So we're left with the movement conservatives, but even those movement conservatives really wanted deregulation of business and really wanted to get rid of taxes. Um, the rest of it they were willing to talk about so that they could keep their evangelical especially, but their, their, their um, right-wing voters on board. But they really didn't expect to have the kinds of things that happened under Trump, like, for example, the putting of the three Supreme Court justices on the court who would overturn Roe versus Wade. They did not see that coming. Yeah, and it's, that's a, a fascinating and bewildering um, alliance between Trump and, and the evangelical uh, wing of the Republican Party, you know, that he, he's the least ideal um, evangelical <laughs> president, except for, you know, it's all transactional. It's all pure, which suits Trump perfectly, you know, and it's a, it's a really interesting. Well, I think it's transactional, but it's not just that, because of course the, the, that movement conservatism depended, first of all, on them as providing votes. Mm -hmm. And second of all, what the evangelicals wanted originally was the return to a traditional society. And that idea of getting rid of social welfare, getting rid of business regulation, all of those parts were part, all of those ideas were part of Phyllis Schlafly way back in the 1960s. Mm -hmm. um, that became, of course, supercharged over the issue of abortion and over all the other kinds of resentments that people like Trump brought to the table. But the reestablishment of a patriarchal society is now so 
deeply ingrained both in the current day Republican Party and in the evangelical system, you can see how they're fellow travelers. And the place that that really jumps out to me is the degree to which today's right-wing Republicans uh, worship people like Viktor Orban of Hungary. And the idea of creating a world in which they you know, erased LGBTQ plus people, they erase women's rights, and they return to a white religious patriarchal society. I mean, it's, you can see those two sides coming together, and you can see it together as well in the ideology that is being developed by sort of the, the elite right-wing Catholic intellectuals talking about getting rid of uh, democracy, talking about the need for an illiberal democracy or Christian nationalism, and then using the evangelicals as their foot soldiers. Yeah, and they've been talking since the 80s about how we are a Christian nation and there is no um, wall between church and state, et cetera. Um, and it's, it's really come to the fore. It's now we have a Speaker of the House who's, who you know, champions all of those views. One thing, though, I, was interesting to me, um, as you were talking, you, you brought up something that you stress in the book, which is the idea of, you know, the, the dispossessed, who aren't really dispossessed, were the ones who, who felt like they were in power and that they had everything going. And this is a repeated theme in American history, which, which you go over. I mean, the Civil War was started by the very group, uh, part of the country, and the very group that had been dominant in American affairs. And um, you don't go into these details, but um, you know, in the 1860 census, uh, because slaves were property, the white South was richer per capita, if you count white people, richer than, than the North. And that- Oh, this, by far, yeah. Yeah, by far. And, and it, was, it was a rebellion of the richest and most powerful part of the country against the rest because, because not because they'd lost anything, but because they felt like there may be some limits put on you know, their, their prosperity and, and wealth and oppression of black people sometime in the future. And that is such a powerful, and that also was a movement which was matched but with, or was fed by a lot of conspiracy theories and whatnot. And it's a really fascinating and horrifying, um, um, cycle isn't the right word. We don't talk about cycle, but, but an element in these kinds of movements. Well, and this is an especially interesting one because the the elite Southern enslavers, and that's a really small group of people, it's less than one percent of the of the American South, let alone the entire nation, have taken control by the eighteen late eighteen fifties of the Supreme Court, the presidency, the Senate, and they were making inroads on the House of Representatives. So what they're really complaining about in 1860 is that the, there has been an election that has put in place somebody who's going to hem them in. And they have turned that into, this destroys everything about our entire society. And it's just a really interesting switch because what, what you're saying in that moment, or what the, the North was saying in that moment is, no, you can't have everything. You know, you, you're, you, you, we're, we want to have a level playing field. And their definition of a leving, level playing field convinced that the, the white elite Southerners, because there's a lot of poor white Southerners that the elite Southerners don't want the, the Northern whites talking to at all. There's a lot of, um, there's this moment where they're essentially saying, you know, we don't want a level playing field because we know in a level playing field, we're gonna lose out. So we need to have all these advantages. And if you take away these advantages, you are going to destroy American society. Once again, something that sounds somewhat familiar, does it not? Yeah, yeah, it really does. And uh, it, it's fascinating too, the, um, you know, the, the elitist derision of mudsills and you know, mechanics. And, and there was a lot of, um, uh, there was actual pamphlets being published before the Civil War about how slave, without slavery, then white people are slaves themselves. They have to have slaves in order to be free themselves. I mean, right. it's really sickening. And yet, um, again, we have a return to some really naked um, rhetoric that in recent years, you know, since Trump became president before that, uh, that you know, a certain barrier has been broken it seems like, even though it's not all new, but to hear the President of the United States uh, deride people for their origin and et cetera, et cetera, uh, that's the way that all these barriers where we all recognize there are certain norms, 
the way all that's been blasted is really terrifying to people, I think. It had been there, though. I mean, makers and takers mm -hmm. is the mud sills. You know, the, the whole idea that some people don't belong, that some people are not contributing to society, the whole division of the world like that has, you know, certainly it's run through American history. But in your 1890s, of course, it was all over. And, and in the 1960s, 1970s, absolutely, you start to see the roots there and you see it, it coming through since then. So that idea, I think in some ways you can look at the world, or at least the United States, as being one in which... There are some people who believe that they are better than others and they have a right and maybe a duty to rule. And there's other people who believe that everybody should be treated equally before the law and have a right to a say in their government. And those two things seem to me to be strands that run through American history and sometimes one uh, dominates and sometimes the other dominates. Mm. And one of the things that, that I th was important, I thought, in the construction of this book was you hear so many times people talking about whether or not we're in a fascist moment in America. And I'm one of those really annoying people who's like, well, let's define fascism. <laughs> but, but, but what really I think is worth remembering is that when Adolf Hitler's lawyers tried to figure out ways to make a legal system that would, in their minds, correctly differentiate among races, where did they look? To the United States, to the Jim Crow laws, and to the indigenous reservations. So the idea that somehow all the trouble started in 1920 when Mussolini got mad because he couldn't convince people to follow him is ahistorical, and certainly it doesn't reflect the American experience. And eugenics laws as well, mm -hmm. yeah, which Hitler really thought were a great thing in the United States. Um, but you know, we've been talking about how, the, you know, think how things are awful, and, and your analysis of the, the Trump years is, is detailed and, and excellent. Um, but, but then you, know, you, you come back and you give people hope. And um, so, I mean, you know, uh, oh yeah, hope, yeah. <laughs> no, it's, it's actually, it's actually a, a very inspiring history which you recount. And, um, and as you mentioned, the, the actors change. You know, you're no longer talking about uh, the, the white men who run everything and, and made sure even in the 14th Amendment, one of the, the great foundations of liberty in, in US Constitution also introduces the word male into the Constitution for the first time. Um, so the, you know, they're there, they can't be avoided, but change starts to come in through uh, um, um, people of, uh, of, of many different, um, in many ways, are very different people. And how did you, what were you thinking as you, you put together that section, the last section well, of American history? That was actually one of the ones that changed the most. There's a number mm -hmm. of new chapters in that whole section because what happened was, first of all, so I thought that when I was writing the, um, the middle section, that I had to give a complete history of the Trump years because nobody knows it better than me, right? I lived it every single night. And, um, <laughs> and so I sat down, and I have to say, I have to give a little shout out here to my agent who is here tonight, Lisa Adams. Um, it, is, it is her fault that this book ever happened. And she had, I, I said that at this moment because um, because she had to read some of the chapters in that early section, and she was the one when I wrote, I wanted each chapter to be about three and a quarter single-spaced pages on Google Docs, which is how I work. And the first version, the trimmed down version I did of the section on Trump and Russia was 27 single-spaced pages. <laughs> and Lisa said to me, she goes, Heather, you don't have to tell everybody everything. <laughs> you, you need to strip it down. So, so when I stripped it down, I discovered that we came really, really close to losing our democracy, and it was really terrifying. But when I looked at that set of essays again after I had them all done, what really jumped out at me is a funny thing, I don't think I've ever said this before, was the NAACP. No matter what I did, like the NAACP or CP was there doing something, and I thought, why the heck don't we know more about the NAACP? So I did a fairly deep dive on the NAACP, and of course, you, you all know the basics of them, right? They, they form in 1909, they, they form on Lincoln's birthday, not technically, but they say they do because they, they wanna grab onto Lincoln's legacy, and you know, they, 
they are behind most of the major events of the 20th century in terms of civil rights. And crucially, W.B. Du Bois is one of the people who founds the NAACP, and they can, he can do anything he wants. You know, he's, he's W.B. Du Bois, he can do whatever he wants, right? And he decides that what he wants to do is he wants to edit the crisis. He wants to edit their magazine. Well, why? Because he recognizes that the way you change society is to make people look at the facts. They can't get away from the facts. If W.B. Du Bois is writing about lynching, you're going to read it, right? If he's writing about how um, laws in certain states are discriminating against black property owners, you're going to read it, right? So I looked at that and I thought, you know, when we're trying to figure out American history, as we are right now with the Trump people pushing the 1776 project and other people pushing other versions of American history that talk about the extraordinary racism and sexism under which we have always lived, what do you do with all these people who lived in really terrible circumstances and figured out how to change everything? Isn't that really the story of America? And that's what the fourth, the third section ended up being. No, I, I agree. And um, some of the, um, you do a great job of, of covering the, the different elements of it. You know, the, the women's movement, um, the labor movement, and these are just like broad sweeping terms for, you know, multitudes of struggles and fights and, and efforts um, to make advancements. And, and that's what, you know, we come around to in terms of, of having hope. I mean, um, you know, and it's, it's, it's always tough when you're in the middle of it. I mean, I feel like the, the women's march at the start of the Trump administration was both incredibly important and it's hard to say exactly how. And, and I, I'm really glad it happened. I think it was important that it happened. Um, but, you know, people will be struggling in the future to identify exactly how. It's the accumulation, it's the, the struggle more than the specific individual result, I think. I think that's right. And I also think that, you know, there are things that I would describe as zeitgeists. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one of the things that I think is important about the way, you know, so this is a short book, so I don't cover everything. You know, I'm following a strand through a lot of different things. So, you know, you, you look at certain things like the 19th century women's movement. I, you know, I don't talk about the fighting within it. I don't talk about, the, you know, I'm trying to find in that section the different, it's 10 chapters and each one tucked in it is a way you fight for democracy. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of the zeitgeist, one of the things that jumped out to me yesterday, I think it was, is, um, and I may have the, the times wrong, I had just written a piece about, um, a letter, a nightly letter about um, uh, the, uh, the FTC, the um, uh, Federal Trade Commission, I'm like the Food and Trade Commission, it's not that FTC, <laughs> and, and about how the Biden administration is actually echoing Teddy Roosevelt and all that, right? So I write this piece by myself, right? Yesterday, there was a piece in one of the major um, legacy medias, maybe the New York Times, that reviewed like a whole bunch of different books about how the world has, or the United States has just discovered income inequality. And then, you know, and there are all these books on it. And then there was a piece today, I think it was in Politico, that talked about how all these young lawyers just are, are think that um, the director of the not the Food and Trade Commission, the Federal <laughs> Trade Commission, uh, Lena Khan, is just the best thing since sliced bread. And I'm like, it feels like when the conversation changes, people pay attention to things in a way that they didn't necessarily before. Mm -hmm. like, like when you have a baby and suddenly everybody has a baby, those babies were actually there before and you didn't pay attention <laughs> to them, right? And that's, um, that I think is, um, part of what is in that third section, but I think it's also part of where we are in this country today. Think about how many people are now talking about democracy. When was, you know, when, when Alexander Vindman 
talked about his principles on the floor of a Chamber of Commerce in 2019. That was the second time I'd heard somebody do that, and the other person had been Adam Schiff, who had dipped his toes in before um, Alexander Vindman did it. But Vindman talking about here right matters and talking about principles, like didn't your head turn? Because nobody had talked about it in so long, and now every time you turn around, someone's like, hey, let's talk about democracy. And I feel like the water is different than it was even five years ago. And that's part of, you know, writing a book about democracy. Yeah. It, when, when Trump was, you know, every time he'd break a norm, um, the press would talk about him as if the norm still stood, you know, instead of recognizing that we're in a very dangerous new period. And um, I always say about Trump, with the Trump, it's always worse than it looks. Um, I don't like him, by the way. I'm sorry if it's, I don't want to offend anyone. <laughs> And, um, and now we have another thing that you mentioned in the book, which we were talking about before, is an important part of American history to me. Um, you know, Trump is talking about how to gut the government and get rid of basically the nonpartisan civil service and get revenge on his enemies and turn it into a highly partisan apparatus down to the, down to the foundations. I mean, this is overturning a century of, more than a century of, uh, of foundational democracy, and it's top of his list for uh, if he gets another term. But speaking of this and the idea of the waters in which we swim, so while people like us are talking about democracy, I think that he has opened the way for a number of people to be talking the same way about destroying democracy. Mm -hmm. So you have, for example, the House of Representatives right now. I don't know if you're paying any attention to this because it's really not in the media, but they're passing bills constantly. And they are, I mean, they're never going to go anywhere, which is why they're not getting any coverage. But they're, you know, they've they've cut the 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 salary for the speaker for the um, director of the uh, environmental protection agency down to a dollar I mean they're doing all they're they're trying they're trying to pass a bill that's up this week that would gut um, the funding for uh, rail lines in the United States by a billion dollars they're cutting it 64 percent they're you know they're all these things that nobody would even have mentioned five years ago now there is language for that and they're they're more than happy to do it Marjorie Taylor Greene for example a representative from Georgia is always talking about getting rid of the government and you see this again and again you see this with the people who are writing the project 2025 the idea of getting the government you see it in the in the Republican study group, which every year publishes its own budget and says things like, we need to get rid of uh, the current guidelines we have for Social Security and Medicare. So one of the things that looks in some ways like the 1850s is the number of people who are on the one hand saying, this is what we think democracy looks like, and it looks like we should all be treated equally before the law and have a right to a say in our government. And then on the other side, you have people saying, you don't get a say. We need to get rid of the government you want and take it back to what we want. Although, unlike in the 1850s, this one is explicitly Christian. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very interesting. The uh, um, uh, the ways in which um, you know we hear often from the right this expression: "We're not a democracy; we're a constitutional republic," which is a way of saying that all of the anti-majoritarian elements in the Constitution are very important to prevent the majority from ruling. Which means what? You know, urban centers. It's just you know the people they don't like. Well, and that and, came from from uh, the John Birch Society. Yeah. That idea, that whole thing, and that's why I was laughing to talk about it, and and always use the express counter that with saying, that's like saying I don't have a dog, I have a golden retriever, because yeah, exactly. uh, democracy and a constitutional republic are both representative democracy. They're both representative forms of government. Yeah, and the re republic and republican were radical terms in the 18th century. I mean, it meant basing a government not on a hierarchical society, but upon the, the, the mass of the population. And that was a radical idea. Republican, as the name of a party, was a specific appeal to a vision 
vision of an equal society, as you have written yeah. many times. And they just turn that language around to argue against, you know, all of the egalitarian aspects of our government. Well, and Madison used the two, the term de uh, democracy and republic almost interchangeably. He was one of the few who did. Mm. But, um, but yeah, that came from the John Birch Society. So anytime anybody says that, you know they're just going for it. And in fact, the John Birch Society used it because that was their excuse for why black people shouldn't vote. We're not a democracy. We're a constitutional republic. Therefore, they are represented even though um, they're not allowed to vote. Um, you know, I... Isn't history cool? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> it really, things look so different, you know, the more you know. Um, uh, anyway, I, I want to start getting into some of these questions because some of them are interesting. And this one, I just want to comment on it because um, it's a good question. Or well, it's a good comment and urging for uh, you to talk a little bit more. But please discuss the role of money in the current extreme political environment. And this is a really important question. But, um, but one thing about Trump that, um, you know, his authoritarianism and his very personal interest in him is, you know, totally monomaniacal focus on himself. Um, changes the way, you know, a lot of people on the left would talk about, oh, they're just doing what the big corporations are telling them to do. You know, and obviously Ron DeSantis is not trying to, to destroy Disney because, you know, the big corporations are telling him what to do. There's, there's an, a populist authoritarian element that overrides what we used to assume was the number one thing for Republicans. And yet money and dark money is rampant and incredibly important in conservative politics. So it's a tricky question. So, Go ahead. And, and I love questions about, um, about the economy at all. So run with those. It was you, when, when I, uh, Joanne and I used to do the podcast, it was always a joke that we, every, year, every week we'd come up with what we were gonna talk about next and I'd always be like, tax policy? Do we get to do tax policy <laughs> this year? And everybody would be like, no, you can only do tax policy. You can only do financial stuff every six weeks. So, you know, you'll notice there was a lot more about Barbie than there was about tax policy. Um, but um, that's a really interesting question in two ways. So the for, let's start with what you just talked about with DeSantis. So those um, movement conservative, traditional establishment Republicans who were leading into 2015, 2016 with Trump wanted a smaller government that would not regulate business and that would cut taxes. That's what they were all about. And if they had to nod to abortion or they had to nod to, you know, cutting things, they would do that to get voters on board. But what they cared about was tax cuts and, and deregulation. And you can see that starting with Reagan in 1981 and going all the way through the Trump tax cuts. And I just, speaking of history and tidbits, I just have to say, I do not understand why we don't talk about, I'm so sorry, tax policy when we talk about the budget deficit that we're facing yes. because Amen. anything you will see will show you that the reasons that we're having trouble with our budget right now is because of the Trump tax cuts and the George W. Bush tax cuts. Not necessarily the Reagan tax cuts, but those are the, the basis of why we're having trouble with the, the budget deficit now. Anyway, um, what happens though is that the, in the, the, those traditional Republicans, or if you will, their move, traditional movement conservative Republicans in 2016, want those tax cuts that they're gonna get under Trump but they wanted a small government. What's happened is Trump took that movement and turned it into this new movement that does not want a small government, they want a big government, and they want a big government that is going to enforce Christian rules on the rest of us, and that's Ron DeSantis, who is using that power against a corporation. And this is why uh, Disney sued him, of course, and, and pretty clearly, I don't know if you saw this, I, I marked it and then I never wrote about it. Um, uh, he actually said to the now returned uh, uh, CEO of Disney, Bob Iger, who's really smart, um, and said, you know, we should just drop that whole lawsuit against me because I've moved on from that. And, <laughs> and I haven't noticed that Disney has dropped that because it's a really important and longstanding issue whether or not this government is going to be stronger and going to go ahead and, and try and impose not the market values that corporations, moder mar modern corporations operate under, but rather the kinds of religious imperatives that people like Ron DeSantis, but not just Ron DeSantis, um, 
uh, Greg Abbott in Texas and um, Christy Nome in North Dakota. I mean, we could we could go on at all the different. Uh, uh, Glenn Youngkin in Virginia is talking about it. You know, all the different places that are Republican dominated North Carolina states that are trying to impose rules on businesses, not just on individuals, but on businesses. So that's one place in which I've been watching to see which way money was going to jump. Because here's the issue: your corporation is not safe in a place where the rules are determined by morality as opposed to by the rule of law, which is why oligarchs from places like the former Soviet republics and um, elsewhere in the world used to park their money in the United Kingdom and in the United States because there they knew it was going to be safe. It wasn't going to be like Orban deciding that he was going to take over all the corporations he's done or like Vladimir Putin has been, it hasn't really made the news here, but he has been madly simply plucking corporations not only from his enemies but now from his friends because he's so desperate to shore up his finances. All right, but <laughs> is this still interesting? I love money policy. Mm. Um, but the question of the role of money in today's politics and how it backed the Republican Party, I think is really important in a larger story. That is, as early as 1986, Reagan's people recognized that his policies of gutting the social safety net and gutting workers' rights and all of those things were not popular. People didn't like them. So they realized they had to do a number of things to try and stay in power. One of the things they do in 1986 is they begin to talk about uh, what we now know as voter fraud. They called it ballot integrity. And their private memos actually said, we expect that this is going to cut black people out of the vote. They also began to talk about filling positions in the judicial branch with true believers, with their own people so that they, the Reagan revolution as um, Edwin Meese, who was um, uh, Reagan's uh, uh, attorney general, Grand Poobah, um, <laughs> kept saying, they're going to make sure that the Reagan revolution cannot be overturned no matter what the voters want. That's 86. By 93, 1993, when the Democrats passed the Motor Voter, what's known as the Motor Voter Act, very quickly Republicans start to say they're only doing it so they can get more voters and those voters are going to be illegal voters. That begins in 1993. 1994, there's two major elections that happen in which Republicans insist that they have uh, lost the elections only because of voter fraud. And there's an investigation in the House and in the Senate run by Republicans. And they go out in front of the cameras every night and they say, this was voter fraud. Our guy won this. And at the end of when they finally have to do a report, they say, well, we couldn't find any evidence, but that's because they hid it so well. Yeah. And that's the beginning of the whole, we're going to have investigations to convince people of things that were happening because it made people start to think there was voter, uh, voter fraud going on. 1998, we get the, the law in Florida that tosses about 100,000 people off the rolls in um, Florida, that's after a fight in Miami over the Miami mayoral candidacy. And in that case, there wasn't even a Democrat in the running. It was a, an independent and a Republican. And it was a totally corrupt election in Miami. But when the uh, Florida legislature puts in place this new law, they knock about 100,000 people out of the vote right before the 2000 election, which turned out to be important. <laughs> in Florida. Everyone looks at the counting there. The counting was important, but so was the fact that 100,000 people ended up not being on the rolls for going into that election. All right, so all of that to say that from that point on, the Republicans leveraged the idea of voter fraud, began by uh, 2010 to worry about gerrymandering. They've been gerrymandering before, but in 2010, they do it on steroids by taking over state legislatures under a, a program called Operation Red Map. Even still, I was coming back to the money, even still, they worry. So what do we get in 2010? Citizens United. Citizens United opens up the way for dark money to pour into elections to do things like continue to, that was over an ad that was being run or over a video that was being run that attacked Hillary Clinton. And then in 2013, we get Shelby versus Holder, which guts the Voting Rights Act.
This has been a long attempt to make sure that Republicans get elected, even if their ideas are not popular. So the role of money there has been such to, to support the Republican Party. You'll see right now, actually, Josh Hawley from Missouri has put in play, has, has suggested he wants to get rid of Citizens United. And everybody got all excited and thought, you know, what's he smoking? Because this is Josh Hawley. And the answer is, it only is uh, organizations that are profit organizations. So nonprofit organizations like Citizens United and like the one that was just established by the guy who gave a gazillion dollars to the Republicans are not covered by it. So, um, but right now in this moment, again, it's gonna be interesting to see if the Democrats can compete simply because so many people are now very concerned both about democracy and the rule of law because your money ain't safe if there isn't a rule of law, and whether or not the, the playing field will be leveled because of that. Good times. Um, <laughs> so uh, on that note, actually, um, we've got a, a question heading into the 2024 presidential election. What are the biggest challenges for facing Democrats and the biggest one facing Republicans? And you know, we could put it this way, you know, what are your what are some of your concrete grounds for hope and what are your most tangible and pressing um, fears right now as we look to the near future? Those are different questions, actually. Yeah, I know they are. Um, I, the, the second one was the, mine. The one thing I was gonna <laughs> say first, though, is that uh, we are more th a, a little less than a year out from 2024. Anything can happen. Yeah. If you had, if, if we had had this discussion in January of 2022, who would have thought that the biggest deal coming up was going to be Russia invading Ukraine? Yeah. I mean, it, it changed everything. And then who would have thought that Volodymyr Zelensky saying, I don't need a ride, I need ammunition, would have changed the world. I mean, that is the phrase of our era, right? It changed everything. So I'm not ready yet to, be, to think at all about what's gonna happen in a year. That being said, um, there's so many wild cards. Like the, the Republican Party has a little problem in that their front runner is not only um, in, been charged with four, I'm sorry, uh, he's been indicted four times, I'm charged with 91 crimes. And that doesn't include the civil cases that he's in trouble with. Um, but the other thing that may be more important is most people have not seen him for a long time. He's been very much under wraps. He looks like a flaming lunatic. Um, he, can't, he can't put together a sentence. He's all over the map. He's, you know, and I think that's gonna hurt voters. Even voters who like him are aware that he is not, when they see him, they will, I, I think one of the reasons he hasn't been doing the debates and hasn't been out in public is because he, 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 love him or hate him, he used to be really good with the crowd. He's just not together. That's a problem for the Republicans. Abortion is a problem for the Republicans. Um, the fact that Democrats have overperformed by eight points in every special election since uh, the Dobbs decision overturned Roe versus Wade has huge red flags flying for the Republicans. We'll see what happens tomorrow in Ohio. Yeah. Um, and Virginia, but especially Ohio, um, where they are voting on adding to the state constitution a uh, uh, guarantee that you that individuals can make their own decisions with their doctors. It's it's much broader than just abortion. What's being added, um, and it protects end of life care things like that as well. Um, the Democrats have the problem of the fact that. Um, their, Biden's message is not getting out. It's just not getting out. And they're combating it every possible way they know how. And I, I'm not quite sure I understand why it's not getting out, but, um, but they have a lot of things going for them as well, which may be the answer to the next point. My, my biggest hopes for 2024 are that in a free and fair election, I have absolutely no doubt that we would have a Democratic president, a Democratic senator, a Senate, and a Democratic House. I just have no doubt. You look at the, and, and, and it's not just me being 
happy and jolly up here. If you look at any election where you have uh, statewide votes and national votes, Democrats win. But we have gerrymandering and we have the Electoral College. And that's my fear, that the nodes of our democracy, the election um, systems in individual states, the Electoral College, the different ways in which our system is skewed have been so skewed with voter, uh, voter suppression, gerrymandering, the Electoral College, all the different pieces in which a minority can, can retain control that even if a majority of us want to have a certain kind of government, that we won't get it. And that's a crisis not only in our moment, it's a crisis for democracy, because when a majority feels that the government does not represent them in a democracy, they lose faith in that democracy. And that will tear it apart from within, even without the, the, the methods that will be necessary to impose power on those people who don't believe in it. And as you probably have read, Trump is already talking about invoking the Insurrection Act as soon as he gets inaugurated, yeah. if he is reelected. So I think if that happens, we got ourselves a problem. Yes, yeah, that is uh, definitely uh, an announcement that he's imposing a, a dictatorship. Um, and without any delay. Why do you think he's telling us all this? Yes. But why do you think he's telling us all this? I mean, if I were going to take over the world, I think I'd stay quiet about it until I had you know, power back in my hands. I, I, this is, I, this, it is a really interesting question. And, um, y you know, Trump, I, we, we all tend to, we, we have the, uh, what's the bias where you want to believe? You believe the news Confirmation that, bias. Confirmation bias. Thank you very much. Um, that's what I, I knew it was that, so. Um, <laughs> anyway, but you know, we all have confirmation bias, but I think, in, and you may want to expand on this because they're not here to hear me. Um, we have in our current system, we get a question about why is compromise and um, negotiation so difficult when that's the only way to get anything done. And yet we live in a world where um, the intense partisanship and uh, the gerrymandering um, self-sorting, um, these are creating not a national map of politics where people have to pay attention to those who disagree with them, but actually politicians get ahead by paying less and less attention to those who disagree with them, paying only more attention to those on their side, and, and the Republican side especially, focusing on those who are more extreme. Don't let anyone be more extreme than you. You know, wherever the base is going to the right, then you go a little farther right. And that's been a real dynamic in the Republican Party, I think. And, um, and it's just, I don't know if it's infecting Trump. I mean, Trump is, you know, he's one of a kind, unfortunately, I guess. But, um, but it certainly has to be affecting, um, you know, Mike Johnson coming out and saying all this crap and then being Speaker of the House and, and putting out bills that just absolutely no way they can get anywhere in the Senate let alone pass the White House. And it's as if it just doesn't matter to them. I mean, what's your thought about well, that? Well, so it doesn't matter in the sense, it's, it's important to remember, and this is identified long ago, and it's true, it, the, the, the Democrats have not radicalized. The Republicans have radicalized. And they have done so in part because of gerrymandering, because once you are in a safe district, um, you don't have to worry about going in front of your voters. You simply have to worry about somebody more, because once there's that R by your name, you're gonna win. Um, so you just have to worry about somebody more radical, getting, getting primaried by somebody more radical, and so that's why they move right all the time. But I think they have been able to do that. It's funny you say that, because I wrote about this tonight, mm. um, and, but it may not come out, because I might read about something else instead. Um, <laughs> um, but. But governing is hard. Governing is a lot of work. And it's, um, it's compromise and it's figuring stuff out and that's what governance used to be. But the movement conservatives wanted to destroy the government. So all they had to do was say no. Totally easy to say no. 
right? And very hard to, to, to actually govern if all you're gonna do is say no. And so what we have now is a number of people who don't understand that the idea of saying no was always just a posture, it was supposed to be a posture. We literally now have members of the House of Representatives who are perfectly happy to shut down the government, who are perfectly happy to hit the debt ceiling and, and destroy, I mean, that was the one for me, destroying the, you know, stop, not letting the, the government borrow money that it had already spent. Um, and making the United States default on its debt, which would have collapsed the entire world economy, and them saying, it's not gonna be that bad. And I'm thinking, did you ever take an economics class? Did you ever take a government class? You cannot do this. And they're like, oh, it's not gonna be that bad. People who just simply don't have any idea of the magnitude of what they're dealing with and no idea of how to make it move forward. And I think you see this with um, with uh, Johnson, the new Speaker of the House. He never ran again. He never had an opponent. Um, he nobody knew who he was when they put him in the Speaker's chair, which is blowing up in their faces if you've been watching the news. And. Um, and he has no idea how to create something t that would actually get through the house. He simply wants to play to his base, and they're happy to blow it all up. I mean, I'm, I, I think at this point we no longer should have the presumption that they really do want to fund the government. I mean, I think there's a lot of pressure for them to do so, but I think a lot of them are like, yeah, whatever. Yeah. Who cares? We'll just, we'll just gut it and we'll start again. Right. And it's all that not having to pay attention to what people other than you think. Or, I mean, you know, a democracy works by, um, you know, you have your values, you fight for them, you realize that other people's values and their aspirations are legitimate. It's legitimate for them to have those values. It's legitimate for someone to say the government should be smaller and, you know, we, we should have a balanced budget. It doesn't mean, when I say legitimate, it doesn't mean I necessarily agree with that, but that's a reasonable position to have. Completely destroying the world economy is not a reasonable position to have. <laughs> well, it's, it's in the past, both major parties agreed with the concept of democracy. Yes. We now have a, a political party, a major political party, that does not believe in majority rule. It does not believe in democracy. And in that case, if they're trying to destroy the government, saying no is exactly the right answer. Mm. It worries me. Honestly, that, that really worries me. There's a lot more of us who actually like democracy, including former Republicans, by the way. This is not necessarily a partisan issue at all. It's a question of whether or not you support democracy because we do need a minimum of two parties to talk about things like fiscal responsibility and tax policy <laughs> and, um, and the different ways in which we disagree with things. That's how a democracy works. That's different than saying, yeah, let's blow it all up. Yeah, I agree. I, um, I, I just, we have time for uh, just one more question. And somebody had asked, you know, how, and we can attach this to, you say Biden's not getting his message out, which is, boy, is that for sure. And we see how younger voters are supposedly split 50-50 um, or 30-30 with the rest undecided. I forget what the numbers are. Um, but how, how do we, how do we get the, you know, facts out. How do we get the message out and a, a balanced analysis and, and restore faith in democracy? I mean, what are the tools that would work? So, first of all, no polls. Polls, you know, if you're, if you're gonna follow polls, the guy you want, and I'm so sorry to do this to him, his name, I, I don't know him personally, but I follow him, Tom Bonnier, who, um, is he looks at the polls and then he looks at the actual voting demographics of the region that is being polled and says, well, this is off by blah, blah, blah points. He's really smart, he's really worth following. And he's the one who said, I don't see a red wave in, in 2022. So it's way too early to look at polls, but polls as are, is so much of the media are currently a way to skew the what people believe, mm. to make them believe it's not fighting, to make them believe it's not worth getting out there. And I think the answer is, simply there, that the way that we defend democracy is by taking up oxygen, by talking about the things that matter, by insisting on the concept of representative government, by saying, yes, we do believe in funding the government. We do believe in choosing the books ourselves that our uh, students read in schools rather than letting a group of outside people come and drag the books off the shelves. We do believe in those 
uh, enlightenment values of basing our world in reality rather than in political, uh, some version of, of politics that is not real. I think we take up oxygen and we aggressively take up oxygen to push back against those voices that are being unnaturally amplified in our society. The same time, we're there for every election, not just for the presidential elections. I think that's one place we've made a big mistake. Local elections, state elections, school board elections, show up at town hall, all of those things. But that we make it clear that we are indeed the majority. And what this always looks like to me is our 1850s. You know, if you lived in 1853, it looked like those elite enslavers had won, right? They had the Senate and the House and the, the uh, Supreme Court and the presidency, and they'd made roads in the House of Representatives, and in 1854, they tried to m p spread their system to the American West through this law uh, called the Kansas-Nebraska Act. And they said, basically, we're going to take over the West as well, and that'll enable us to take over the North, and pretty soon this entire country is going to back human enslavement, and we're going to spread it across the world. Northerners woke up and they said, listen, we don't agree about in, you know, immigration and we don't agree about finances and we don't agree about internal improvements, but by God, we can agree that we're not going to be an oligarchy. By 1856, they had a new political party. By 1859, Abraham Lincoln had redefined government, saying that government should respond to ordinary Americans, not just to rich guys who owns, owned other human beings. By 1860, he had been put into the White House. He had been elected to the White House. By 1861, he's in the White House. By 1863, he has signed the Emancipation Proclamation, ending human enslavement as a system in the United States. And by November of 1863, he had given the Gettysburg Address, calling for a government of the people, by the people, and for the people, and a new birth of freedom. Less than 10 years, and it wasn't Abraham Lincoln who did that. It was Abraham Lincoln who articulated it. It was the American people standing up and saying, this is our country, and by God, our government should respond to us, should support us, and should answer to us. And if they could do it then when only white propertied men could vote, by God, we can do it today. Amen. Well, I'm afraid we're out of time. <laughs> um, but our thanks to Heather Cox Richardson, the author of Democracy Awakening, Notes on the State of America. <laughs> and to Roy and Betsy Eisenhart for supporting tonight's program. Um, Uh, please, if you haven't already, pick up a copy of uh, Heather's book here or at your local independent bookstore. Um, and if you'd like to support the club's efforts in making virtual and in-person programming possible, please visit the website um, commonwealthclub.org. And I'm TJ Stiles. Thank you, and please take care. Thank you, TJ.